Okay, so good morning everybody. And uh, so let's as usual start with a, just a brief recap uh, of what we were discussing yesterday. So discussing our system was just, uh, so N free fermions, uh, free means non-interacting in a confining potential. It's okay? Okay. So, uh, so we have this confining potential, and I was discussing in 1D, but you know, this is, you can easily generalize to higher dimensions. So there is a potential, confining potential, and we have this bunch of fermions sitting in this potential, right? And uh, so the single particle Hamiltonian was just uh, And which has these eigen eigenfunctions, phi kx, and with uh, eigenvalue psi k, which are these discrete energy levels. Okay. And then, uh, first thing we mentioned is that that any many-body fermionic state not necessarily the ground state, so if I look at with energy e, if I look at the you know the uh, many body wave function mod square absolute value square, so this is just the quantum probability density in that state, then uh, you can always write this as uh, as a determinant of a kernel which was uh, so this many body fermionic state is labeled by a set of occupation numbers which for fermions are either 0 or 1 so you just occupy if you you know whatever states you want to occupy you can put only one at most one fermion in each state and then, uh, in that state, whose energy is uh, summation n k epsilon k, and then you can write the wave function mod square as a determinant, and this determinant on this kernel was uh, kernel is also labeled by these occupation numbers, and this was simply. And you could check that by using the reproducibility property of this kernel. And so the process here in that particular sector, any, partic any, any E energy sector, the process is determinantal. Okay. And then we just uh, focused on zero temperature first. And uh, also in the case of just harmonic potential, so that the energy levels are just k plus half h bar omega, where k is going from 0 to integers. So in that case, in that so then we are interested in the ground state wave function mod square. And this we saw by explicit computation that this is some normalization constant times e to the power minus alpha square summation xi square times this van der Mond square, where this alpha was square root of m omega by h bar. Okay. So, the <coughs> so the first, so here we are just occupying the first k in n levels, okay, so up to the Fermi level. And the Fermi energy is just is just put k equal to n minus 1, so it will be this. Yes, okay? So you occupy the first n level, still the Fermi level. So the first remark is that, uh, you know, the, uh, so this is of course exactly in one-to-one -one correspondence to GUE, so this 
up to this factor alpha. So the positions of the fermions in the ground state in a harmonic potential, they are identical in law to the eigenvalues of the GUE matrix. And the second point I want to say is that, you know, I mean, within, in this derivation, what you see is that even though you started with, with non-interacting fermions, okay, so there is no explicit interaction term here, you know, in the many-body Hamiltonian, which was just a sum of the single particle Hamiltonians. So there is no interaction term here. But nevertheless, when you look at the ground state wave function, the positions of the fermions, they get correlated because of Pauli exclusion principle. So this term here, the van der Mond term, which comes purely because of the Pauli exclusion principle. So therefore, even though the system is non-interacting, there is non-trivial cor strong correlations between the particle positions in real space when you look at the ground state wave function. Okay? And so this is the sort of important point. I mean, uh, sometimes you, know, you will hear that uh, people say, oh, uh, this free fermions is all trivial. Okay. Well, I mean, the free fermions is trivial as far as the spectrum is concerned, but depending on which observable you are looking at, so for if, you look at the spe if you're looking at the spatial fluctuations of the positions of the particles, it's highly non-trivial, okay, because of these correlations here, okay. So, <coughs> and in that ground state sector, so the kernel was just, uh, because you occupy only the first n levels, so it's just this contribution k equal to 0 to n minus 1, yeah. And these are these just uh, Hermit polynomials times Gaussian. And uh, in particular, we saw that the density, which is the kernel at unequal, at equal points, k n, k of x, x. So this was just uh, And this guy, as I said, that if you plot it, you will get the Wigner semicircular law in the large n limit. But in general, so this will be, in general, of course, there will be tails because of finite n. But in the large n limit, it will go and converge into the Wigner semicircular law with the edge, which is at square root of 2n by alpha, square root of minus 2n by al alpha. So there is this center here. And near the center, this is the bulk. And the length scale in the bulk is roughly interparticle distance is 1 over square root of n. Okay. Whereas near the edge, the particles are farther apart from each other. And we saw this is n to the power minus 1 sixth. And in particular, if you take this uh, kernel, kxx, kxx prime, and if I look at this kernel, if I take these two points, you know, these are just two points, so if I take both points to the in the bulk, then gi this gives rise to the sine kernel, which is uh, mentioned here. And uh, if, you if you take both points close to the edge, then this gives rise to this airy kernel. And this is just follows from this expression here, and you take the asymptotic sum in near the edge, you linearize the potential V of x, and that gives you the area function and replace the sum by an integral. Whereas in the bulk is just a you know just a free free particle, so so it's just a e to the power i k x type of things. And so again, if you substitute, you get this sine kernel. Okay. So and then the third thing we discussed, still at zero temperature, which is uh, the position of the rightmost fermion. So this is the <coughs> So this again is a random variable because of the quantum fluctuation here and so this is exactly same as the GUE so therefore the x max this position at t equal to 0. So it will fluctuate around its average value with some distribution. And the typical fluctuations here will scale like n to the power minus 1 sixth, which is precisely the sort of typical interparticle distance between the particles. So that's the scale. Okay. So this, we said that this will be mean value will be the edge plus 
a correlate plus a width this fluctuation times a random variable so this width was just uh, alpha root 2 n to the power minus 1 sixth and this random variable which becomes independent of n in the large n limit so this is the probability distribution the cumulative distribution for example is less than s this was the fred home determinant this is the tracy witham distribution i minus projector k ary yes and this projector is basically over the interval s to infinity so this is the whole probability this is exactly what Herbert was talking about in his uh, lecture and uh, so I didn't derive this result but you know this was exactly similar to Herbert so I didn't want to uh, do it but those of you who are present in the discussion yesterday so there I showed how to how this freedom determinant comes from this uh, from this uh, in response to the question by uh, What's the name? Jaroslav. Jaroslav, okay. So, uh, thank you. <laughs> okay, so this is the this thing. So, so this much was, you know, uh, and this k a r e is precisely this uh, this edge edge a r e function, okay? And uh, so this was more or less known even before Tracy Widom that this is a Fredholm determinant. So, what Tracy and Widom did is to analyze this function. So, this is a function f2 of s. So, you know, to derive the asymptotics is not that easy from this function. So, what they did is to um, maybe I can I'll just mention the result and this was a non-trivial computation so what they showed I mean I'll just do it for the GV so this function f2s the scaling function so this was so this is Tracy Widom where this function q of x satisfies a nonlinear on level 2 equation with the boundary condition that when x goes to infinity this goes to the steady function okay. so <coughs> so you know Analyzing the Fredholm determinant and to show that it satisfies a nonlinear differential equation, this is a very non trivial step. And this is what Tracy and Widom did. And once you have this form, I mean, you cannot solve explicitly this equation, Q of x, but you can easily derive the asymptotics of this from this. And, uh, well, easily, I mean, at least some limits. So the asymptotics were when s goes to minus infinity, it has this tail s cube over 12. And when s goes to plus infinity, it goes like exponential minus four third of s to the power three by two. Okay. So, so once again, you know, I mean, I, I, this problem of free fermions in a harmonic potential has been around for one hundred years, more than hundred years, right? But you know, it depends on what question you are asking. Nobody knew that there was a Tracy Widom distribution in the if you look at the positions of the rightmost fluctuations uh, particles okay so basically you know free fermion hamiltonian people solve in the second quantized notation and then in second quantized notation spectrum is trivial but you don't probe the question of real space okay so if you look at the fluctuations of real space even in the ground state you have non trivial physics there okay so this is what i wanted to emphasize okay and then finally last point that we just briefly alluded to but not really uh, I mean you could see that there is universality with respect to <coughs> the quantum potential confining potential so if so for any smooth confining potential of the type x to the power p for instance So if you take, for instance, just uh, mod x to the power p, something like that, okay, without any singularity, just a smooth function, then, you know, I mean, because you are looking at the edge statistics, so if we just linearize this function around this point x, so remember that I was just setting x equal to the square root of whatever, 2n over alpha 
plus some n to the power minus one sixth times y, and just solve the single particle Hamiltonian wave function. So then, because of the linear potential, because you just expand this guy around this. This is exactly what Herbert was doing. So there will be something plus something into y. So it's a linear potential in the uh, difference coordinates. So you're just expanding, linearizing around the Fermi surface, basically. And that gives rise to the airy functions uh, for the single particle wave functions. And when you substitute in the kernel, you basically get the airy kernel. So you can see that this is sort of universal as long as it's smooth potential. But if you have singular potential, okay, where you cannot li linearize, then, of course, you won't get the Airy kernel. So, Tracy Weedham distribution or the Airy kernel in general would be valid for any smooth potential. Okay? But if I take a singular potential, so for instance, a simple thing that you can think of is just a box potential. Okay? So, let's say minus r2 plus r. So, here, of course, you cannot linearize it, right? So, you would expect that the box potential would have a different universality class than the Airy kernel. And indeed, indeed this is true. So I won't do it in all great detail, but this was, I mean, this is sort of easy to do. So now single particle wave functions will be just uh, so the box potential means that the potential is zero for x less than r and is infinity outside. So which means you have to just solve this single particle eigenfunctions with the vanishing boundary condition at minus r and plus r. So this is, of course, textbook quantum mechanics. So you get the energy eigenvalues which are quantized as where n can be 1, 2, 3, etc. And the wave functions, okay, again up to some normalization, this is just... Uh, Mm, sign. Okay. So you have the single particle spectrum, and so from this you want to calculate, for instance, the ground state wave function, many body wave function. So again, this will be the Slater determinant of the single particle function. So you just occupy the first n levels up to the Fermi surface and uh, so this will be just 1 over square root of n factorial times determinant of this phi, phi i of xj so n by n determinant ij less than equal to n less than equal to 1 okay so just just compute this determinant I won't do the computation but if you do that what you will find is that wave function mod squared now <laughs> okay again up to some normalization constant this will be cosine square of okay it requires a little bit of uh, these things I, I won't do it in detail but I'm just telling you the result So you get a, you know, again, sort of Van der Mond type of form, but in terms of these sort of modified uh, functions, uh, sine x, pi x, y. And if you call this u y is as half times 1 plus sine pi x, i by 2, just make a change of variable. And then these u i are between 1 and 0. So the joint distribution, this zero temperature joint quantum fluctuation of these guys, which is just proportional to this, I mean, essentially. So in terms of the u1 coordinates, u1, u2, u3. So this has a simple form, which is, okay, so up to, again, some normalization constant. I don't write the normalization all the time, so this is just... Okay, so this is... 
So you say this is a different type of where UIs are between 0 and 1. Okay. So this is a different type of random matrix ensemble. It's called the Jacobi ensemble. The name Jacobi comes from the fact because the orthogonal polynomial associated with such ensemble is, which I, okay, I didn't talk about it, but these are called Jacobi polynomials. Okay. So, uh, so this, so this, okay. So if you are interested in this, so this will be, okay. So here is uh, just a reference, recent reference. So this is a well-known ensemble in random matrix theory, uh, but which comes from some, okay, I, I will not, it's something called MANOVA matrix, let me not get into the details. But the point I'm trying to say is that, you know, that if you, you know, if you look at such singular potential, again, you can relate it to some random matrix ensemble, okay. And this random matrix ensemble has been very useful in the study of, for example, conductance to a quantum dot. Carlo Binecker and uh, collaborators and other people, they have worked quite a bit on this, these kind of things. And uh, so this is again sort of uh, related to very simple free fermion problem. Okay, and so so obviously so here you can see that again so this will be determinantal process. Okay, and uh, so you can actually compute the kernel, and uh, so I won't do it in great detail, but you know the kernel again. If I look at the edge kernel, if I put two points. So what is the so what's the analog of weakness semicircular law? So in this case as you would expect in a box basically in the large end limit the uh, the density will be just flat. Let's say between minus one to plus one I put R equal to one. So this will be a flat density, okay, constant density. So analog of this. But if you again zoom in at the edge, so what we'll see is that you know it will fall off like this. And if you zoom in this part and analyze the edge kernel. So, so if, if I take both points to be very close to the edge, so this is actually has a simple form, which is not exactly sine kernel, but sine kernel plus its image. Basically, you can think of this like a, mm, like a absorbing boundary condition, so it's a zero here. So it's like, you know, if you have a charge here, this is the usual uh, bulk sine kernel, but then you have a contribution coming from the image of that, so that the, it vanishes exactly at the, at the edge x equal to 1, and th this is the, just the image kernel of that with a negative sign. Okay? So this is, the, this is the kernel associated to this determinantal process for particles in a box. And so again, you can work it out what is the... Mm, you know the uh, the distribution of the rightmost particle position, so probability that x max is less than or equal to some number w. So this will be again is some scaling function of one over n times one minus w, because the typical particle interparticle distance here is one over n, so that's the scale. Okay. Sorry, it should be n n times this. And uh, and this function again it will be some Fredholm determinant with this kernel. Okay. okay, here the interval is actually zero because it's just a you know this way, so it will be zero to s k h. And you can you know you can analyze these asymptotic behaviors and so on. So this is sort of uh, mentioned in this paper here. Okay. But you know, just to show you that you know, not everything is airy kernel, it depends on you know, if you have a singular potential, uh, like a box, which is a natural choice, and you get a completely different university class for the extreme uh, statistics of the rightmost fermion. Okay, so this is sort of a sort of longish recap. So now what we want to do is that so far I was talking about zero temperature, and now we want to ask uh, 
what happens at finite temperature. So zero temperature means that you have just quantum fluctuation, right? It's just these guys are fluctuating. They're not, you know, fixed variables. They're fluctuating because of quantum fluctuation, which is in the encoded in the wave function. Now, when you increase the temperature, so in, in addition to quantum fluctuation, you also have thermal fluctuations, okay? And uh, so how to set up this problem, okay? So first thing that happens, is that this fact that you know you could write down the ground state wave function mod square as a sort of random matrix ensemble, you know, like a joint distribution of the eigenvalues of GUE in the case of harmonic oscillator. So, so that connection to GUE gets lost when you crank up the temperature. Okay, let's say D equal to one. Okay. So, to see that, you know, how do we set up then this problem? Okay. So. So we want to, you know, again think in terms of the joint distribution of the position of the particles, but now in presence of a finite temperature. Okay. So if I want to analyze the spatial fluctuations of particle position, this is the basic, you know, fundamental object, the joint distribution of the posi positions of the particles. So how will I set it up? So this will be obviously, so this is, I'm going to work in the canonical ensemble first. So I'm imagining that my fermions are, s you know, connected to a heat bath, which has a temperature T, and so therefore, this thing, the natural definition, would be. So you take any many-body state E, you calculate the wave function mod square. So this is like if I am in that state E, this is the quantum fluctuation, okay, and then I have to put a weight factor here, which is just the Gibbs weight factor, because that energy itself occurs with probability proportional to exponential minus beta e. And then, of course, you have to put this normalization factor such that the total probability is normalized, okay, so that this is a properly defined measure. So if this is one, if you integrate, and these are normalized, Ortho, you know, normalized wave functions, sum over all e, normalized uh, wave functions, so this will be one, so the partition function is the usual definition, that is sum over all e, exponential minus beta e. So this e is the energy of the many-body state. Okay? So this is our starting point, the canonical uh, finite temperature joint distribution of particles. So it has both quantum fluctuation as well as thermal fluctuations in it. So it's also, of course, useful to another way of writing it in terms of if I label my many-body energy state by these occupation numbers for fermions, so that E is summation n k epsilon k, and these n k's are zero and one. So then you see that you know just okay. This is I mean up to this factor here. So this will be E. Uh, okay. Let me write it down first. But this guy here, we have just seen that you can write it as a determinant of a, each each state. I can write as a determinant of a kernel, right? So this guy I can replace up to this n factorial here, uh, determinant of k. And here I'm summing over all n k. And of course you are working in the canonical ensemble, so therefore you have another constraint 
delta function which says the total number of particles must be fixed. Okay. So this is the measure. In terms of the occupation numbers, this is exactly the measure that you have. And then, so you have the, you know, positions are encoded in, inside this uh, kernel, and this k is precisely the So basically you solve the single particle wave functions, you have all the eigenfunctions and eigenvalues which are phi kx and epsilon k's and once you have that then I can, you know, for any choice of n k's I can write the kernel like this and then I have to put this in this determinant and I have to do this sum. Okay, So this is the, so you can see that if I am at zero temperature, as temperature goes to zero, of course you pick up from this only beta, so beta goes to infinity, this beta is 1 over temperature by the way. So when beta goes to infinity, you pick up only the ground state from this sum. Okay, So only the states which are, you know, n k's are uh, like, n, you know, the first, you know, you occupy 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 state. So that's the one only contributes. And then we are just back to what we analyzed before, namely the the ground state wave function mod square. Okay, so now we want to see what happens in presence of temperature. Okay, so okay, here I'll skip all the details because I won't have time to do all the details. But uh, but the first thing that point I want to point out is that in, if you work in the canonical ensemble, so even though each sector is determinantal, when you have the sum here, the process is no longer determinantal, meaning that. I cannot write this guy as a you know single determinant. Okay, so so in the canonical ensemble for n fixed with finite temperature, except at zero temperature, process is not determinantal. Okay, so I can no, no longer say that you know the m point correlation function which is obtained by keeping m fixed and integrating over the rest of the coordinates i can also write that as a determinant of this sum kernel okay so it's no longer determinantal okay however so the what's the trick then trick as usual you know i mean you know this from uh, fermions that you have to work in the grand canonical ensemble So grand canonical ensemble simply means that you know this fixed constraint that you have a total number of particles fixed, you just replace this guy by a weight which is like a fugacity to the power summation n k, and you fix this fugacity. I mean, you can I mean you can just represent this delta function by this as an integral representation and do a saddle point analysis, but this is sort of equivalent to saying that the grand canonical means that you introduce this fugacity z to the power n summation nk and you fix this z by saying that finally your you know number of particles should be equal to the expectation value of this nk's in the grand canonical ensemble okay. and this equation here is just the saddle point equation if you just do i mean you, you know this i mean the, if you canonical and grand canonical they are connected to each other by saddle if there is a saddle point exists then there is a you know they are exactly equivalent to each other okay but of course there are some cases you, you may not saddle point may not exist you can have phase transition and so on the equivalence of ensembles will not hold but the main point is that once you work in the grand canonical ensemble that is if you put z to the power n k and then you see that the you know the, this this object here the weight you can write as z e to the power minus beta epsilon k to the power n k product over all k okay. and then okay and this is this requires some uh, steps to show then you can show that in the grand canonical ensemble the process is determinantal again so I won't 
prove this because this will take uh, a long time. But uh, I'll just okay, I'll just give you one reference if you are interested. So this was. So this is a long paper with all the details and everything. So I mean, just referring to that. And uh, so what you can show is that in the grand canonical ensemble, that is, if I fix the fugacity Z and work in this en grand canonical ensemble, then you can show that indeed this is determinantal. That means if I calculate any endpoint correlation function, then I can also express it as a determinant. And the kernel of that determinantal process. write it here so I'll write it like okay Z fix or mu fixed if you like mu being the just a fugacity so Z is the right is e to the power beta mu It just becomes, I mean, it's not normal, natural to expect this, but you know, it requires some steps to show this, where by NK average, I just print that the average of, uh, you know, Z e to the power minus beta epsilon K, because NK average means it's just a, you know, just a fermion, so just a single fermion. So this will be 1 plus z e to the power minus beta k. So nk is either 1 or 0. So it's 1 with, uh, with this probability and with 0 with, uh, with the opposite complementary probability. So this is just the Fermi factor. So it's you know it's it's just uh, and you determine this z by the from, from the constraint that total number of particles is fixed. So therefore, this will be sum over all k, one over one plus z, e to the power beta epsilon k. Okay. So if you give me n, so I'll determine z from this, and then I plug it in and I get this Fermi factor, and you just put it th there, and then okay, this is this z if you like or n and this is the kernel so the grand canonical ensemble the system is determinantal with this kernel okay again as i said i mean i'm not showing you all the proofs but you can you can just find all the details here yeah no so this is a good question so i mean this is one example. So I, I said that the, you know the the reproducibility property is a sufficient condition, but not a necessary condition. Okay, so here you actually reproducibility doesn't hold. Okay, but still you have just by computing and you have to use again this cauchy bin identity and all these things. So it's a little bit of detail. I didn't want to say you can find this uh, in this thing. There's one one whole section where this is proved uh, that why this is determinantal. Okay. No, there is, oh, sorry, say it again. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I mean, it's, it's in, in sense that I think the main sort of, you know, things you can trace back to the fact that in the canonical ensemble, this becomes a product over the, you know, it's like almost independent particles. So you can think of these NKs as independent particles, okay. So they, they decouple. See, the point is that the NKs are correlated if you have a canonical ensemble. But if you work in the grand canonical, the NKs almost becomes independent random variables. And that's the sort of reason why this works, basically. And that's why it sort of reduces to the Fermi factor, okay.
Ja, ja, sure. No, this is what I explained yesterday. So, yeah, right. Okay. So, uh, all right. So, therefore, you know, so let's, uh, so now with this discussion back here, so, so this is the thing. So, so therefore, the joint distribution of the positions of the fermions is therefore, you know, just uh, given by this. And as I said, that uh, this is, uh, you know, in the canonical, grand canonical ensemble, that this is just becomes a determinantal process. And so you can write this as a determinant of a kernel, and this kernel is just uh, precisely this uh, uh, Fermi factor here. Okay, so it is about beta mu minus beta mu is just one over z. Okay, and you fix this, you know, this fix uh, this chemical potential or uh, fugacity just from this constraint n equal to this. So important thing is that you know n not everything is exactly so if you are interested in calculating some some particular fluctuations of linear statistics and so on you have to be a little bit careful in this using this ensemble you know canonical ensemble and grand canonical ensemble may not always give you the same answer okay but at least for the you know uh, correlations and bulk and edge properties this this you can use this equivalence okay all right so uh, and also, you know, this exactly same kernel, it's, it turns out it, it appears in a class of matrix models, okay? So this was actually first uh, pointed out by Moshe Neuberger Shapiro. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a slightly different type of matrix models. Again, I won't get into the discussion. Also, Johnson discussed this. Uh, and uh, so this is, a, this is this sort of uh, kernel that appears here. Okay. So now let's uh, look at now let me okay we have seen that the zero temperature so you have these uh, scales so there's the interparticle distance which is 1 over square root of n and then there's the edge uh, particle you know the interparticle distance at the edge which is n to the power minus 1 sixth okay and uh, so so now you ask at, at finite temperature what are the scales okay or what is the energy scales relevant scales basically okay and uh, so to, to guess that again, you can sort of you know use a very simple physical argument. So you see that the uh, for you know uh, for any quantum particle, uh, there is at finite temperature there is always a sort of wave packet associated with it. Okay, and this is called this sort of this de Broglie wavelength, the wavelength of this lambda t, which is inversely proportional to uh, square root of temperature. So remember, this is 1 over square root of n, which is L bulk. And here, the L edge was uh, n to the power minus 1 sixth. So this de Broglie wavelength basically tells you that you know, this is with each pa quantum particle, you have a sort of you know, wave packet surrounding it at finite temperature. So at zero temperature, of course, you know, the quantum fluctuations are very important, so it's, it's infinite. But at finite temperature, it has a finite wavelength. So that means if there is any other particle which is within this wavelength, then it will feel, you know, the quantum uh, fluctuations is important, okay? But if the particle is outside, then, you know, it's like a correlation length, quantum correlation length. So if the particle is outside, then, you know, the, 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 the it will be almost behave like classical particles, independent particles, okay? So this de Broglie wavelength sort of controls the crossover from quantum to classical as a function of temperature. So let's look at the bulk. Uh, so in the bulk, so you would say, therefore, it will be quantum. I mean, it will behave like the quantum system if the de Broglie wavelength is bigger than the typical interparticle separation in the bulk, right? So because then the two particles are within this same wave packet in some sense. So this would mean if you just substitute this here and use that L bulk at zero temperature is n to the power minus half, then you see that this automatically gives you a temperature scale which is the just the Fermi, Fermi energy scale h bar omega n. Okay, so temperature when temperature is of order n, so that's where basically the bulk will fill the temperature. Okay, otherwise it will behave like zero temperature almost. Okay, when the temperature is of order n or beyond, uh, then it will you know it will start you know it will have a strong effect 
in the bulk. Now, if you do it in the edge, uh, uh, sorry, uh, and, and on the other hand, if lambda t is less than this, that means temperature is bigger than this, then these will behave like classical particles almost. Okay? So quantum is if temperature is less than the Fermi energy, and if classical, its temperature is bigger than the Fermi energy, and Fermi energy is just proportional to n. Okay? Now, if we do the same thing in the bulk, in the edge, okay? so you see, if this will be quantum, if, again, the thermal de Broglie wavelength associated with these particles is bigger than the L edge, L edge being n to the power minus one-sixth, so this automatically gives you a temperature scale at the edge, which is n to the power one-third, much smaller than the Fermi energy. Okay? So that means I will start seeing some effect when the temperature crosses this value n to the power one-third. If I increase the temperature, so basically what happens is that you increase the temperature, unless you hit the n to the power one-third, nothing much happens. It's like zero temperature quantum and then when you go beyond this temperature okay that means if the temperature exceeds this value then it will sort of you know it will have a classical effect quantum effects will get washed out basically okay so this is a very simple exercise you can just you know just get the relevant scales at the bulk and the edge again there are two two different length scales associated with it okay so we should remember this this guy here that at the edge The relevant length scales is thus h per omega into the power one third. So this will be relevant a little bit later. Okay, so so now let's first ask what is the sort of average density at finite temperature. That's the first object to ask, right? The global lab. So remember, at zero temperature, this was Wigner semicircular law. I increase the temperature. So what is the what does the density look like? So density again, this is the kernel which is at equal points and therefore you know this is the average number of particles so this is just phi k mod square d times the Fermi factor. Okay, So I can plot this as a function of temperature and again mu has to be determined in terms of n. So what you would expect again as a function of temperature that at zero temperature again as I said it will be in a semicircular law as we have seen. Now at very high temperature what happens is that at very high temperature, you know, these, these, these are con class, almost classical particles. They don't see the quantum nature. So Pauli exclusion principle in some sense is totally irrelevant. And you would expect that this is just classical particles sitting in a harmonic uh, well. And therefore, you will just the Gibbs, the Gibbs Boltzmann distribution e to the power minus Vx. Okay? So in the case of Gaussian potential, this will be just uh, Gaussian essentially. Okay? So these are the two limits. And you want to know how the density you know, evolves from the zero temperature weakness semicircular law to this Gaussian distribution at very high temperature. Okay? And for that, you just have to you know, just compute that object there. Stick. Okay. You just have to compute this, uh, this object here. Just plug in the, uh, the single particle wave functions and the energy and, and uh, determine the chemical potential from, from N using this, uh, this relation here. And that's it. Okay, so I will not do the details, just to show you the result. So, uh, so again, the, you know, the two sort of natural dimensionless variables. I told you already that in the bulk there is a scale, temperature scale, which is pro proportional to Fermi energy, which is h bar omega n. So this will be natural dimensionless variable. So this is a function of two variables, right? X, uh, three variables actually, x, n, and t. Okay, but uh, the two natural dimensionless variables. One is this uh, y which is uh, n over t, the Fermi energy by temperature. And the other, you can make out from this combination that this is just proportional to x. With, uh, and this is, you know, this is the energy of the harmonic oscillator, uh, energy scale associated with inverse uh, square length, and this is the temperature. Okay? So these are the two natural variables. So the, my density I can write, even though it's a function of three variables, in the scaling limit, large n limit, I can write it as a function of just two variables, two scaled variables, y and z. Z. Okay. I want to plot this, and uh, so so that's what I said. That the density, therefore, is just a function of two variables instead of three variables. It becomes a scaled function of two variables with a factor one over square root of an outside. And this function r y z. So you know you can compute it explicitly, and this is just uh, you know the, okay. This is this polylog function, and uh, okay, it has a complicated. Uh, functional form I'll plot it I'll give you a plot immediately and uh, and this is as I said yesterday also that this these results you could derive 
from the semi classical approximation also you don't have to go through all this but here you can see clearly uh, you won't get semi classical approximation the age fluctuations but the bulk you can still get it okay but uh, but this is a sort of more uh, rigorous way of doing it and uh, so if you plot this function so this is what you will see so i'm just plotting this function r y z y is this way z is this way and this is the r so what you see is that you know so this is zero temperature so you know y was such a scaling variable so zero temperature means y is infinity so you see this semicircular law and then as temperature evolves it goes into a gaussian form so you ju just encode it in this in this exact uh, form of the density okay so this is the sort of uh, analog of the wigner semicircular law at finite temperature and then you can ask okay i mean if i'm not n is not infinity but large and i want to uh, look at the edge fluctuations here and uh, you know near the edge and i can analyze this density again you know you have this form and uh, so you can write this density as a scaling function again and this scaling function f1z will just be this area function square divided by this you know this comes from the fermi factor essentially okay so again you know that f so where b is this uh, you know remember the scale here is n to the power 1/3 so this is a natural scale n to the power 1/3 over t so this b is just a parameter so at zero temperature means b goes to infinity when b goes to infinity this gets cut off from zero to infinity and you get a square du which is this uh, this function that i mentioned yesterday that is this uh, breza and bowick and forrester and company they computed so this is a zero temperature uh, form of that so so if you plot this so uh, say when zero temperature limit that means b goes to infinity remember b is this factor here okay so then you get back the uh, previous form of the density that we plotted yesterday uh, this was this form here now when you introduce this when you have a finite temperature this b is non zero and then you have this form and if you look at the asymptotics so here remember the here it was going like e to the power minus z to the power 3 over 2 but now it goes exponentially for finite b okay and uh, and again when you know when uh, z goes to minus infinity it goes like square root of mod z to to match with the uh, bulk result okay so this is the density density at the bulk density at the edge okay and you can ask the same thing about the kernel now so if i take these two points x and x prime remember at zero temperature it was a sine kernel now i am asking at finite temperature what's the form of the kernel okay again the, all the explicit formulas are there okay i won't do it in the details but you can you can actually write down the kernel explicitly this function uh, this scaling function is given by this and again when you take this y uh, goes to infinity that means zero temperature limit this just becomes sine z by z sine kernel usual and this is the sort of generalization of the sine kernel if you like and again you can sort of prove that this is universal and so on and so forth okay and uh, and then we come to the edge kernel and uh, but maybe i mean want to stop now or uh, okay no i think I, we can we can come to the edge kernel at finite temperature you know just after this so this is so this is so let's stop here so basically bulk kernels we described the bulk kernel here at finite temperature and now i want to describe the edge kernel at finite temperature and then we'll see and then we'll make this connection to this kpz problem that uh, that harvard talked about okay so let's stop here then okay so uh so we talked about the so far the you know the bulk uh, what happens from how it changes from sine kernel to this uh, more non trivial kernel as in temperature increases we also looked at the edge density and now i'm looking at the edge kernel i take two points very close to the edge and i ask as i crank up the temperature what happens to the edge kernel okay so that's the point we stopped and again the natural scaling limit as i said you know this is this uh, scale that you can get from the physics which is the de broglie wavelength uh, thermal de broglie wavelength is comparable to the the interparticle separation at the edge and uh, so if you go and work in your formula this this guys here and just you know do the scaling usual you will fi find the edge scaling function which is uh, this k edge and uh, it sort of uh, it has this form which is uh, precisely this where this number b here again 
is uh, n to the power one third by t. This is the dimensionless scaling variable. Okay. So this is a sort of finite temperature generalization of the Airy kernel, and uh, again, if you take the b going to infinity limit, that is zero temperature limit. This integral, you know, just gets cut off from zero to infinity, and you get back the usual, usual Airy kernel. Okay. And uh, so, and at this point, if you remember Herbert's lecture, that exactly same kernel appeared in his lecture as well. Okay. And okay. F f and second point is as usual that it's. It's universal even at finite temperature. Okay, so now let's look at you know the just to make I want to just make a link to to Harvard's lecture. So uh, so this same kernel appeared in the KPZ equation if you remember. So okay, let me just first uh, say it. Therefore, so if I so once we have this H kernel which is temperature dependent, and uh, then if I'm interested in the position of the rightmost particle. But now at finite temperature, so I mean zero temperature. We have already seen that it's given by the tracy Tracy-Widom distribution. Question is, as I increase the temperature, so now there will be thermal fluctuations in addition to quantum fluctuations, and we want to know what is the distribution of these particles. Okay. So again, once you know this H kernel and this experimental process, so the probability that this position is less than or equal to m, the cumulative distribution, you can write. As a single scaling function of this scaled variable, so R edge is uh, uh, precisely the zero temperature edge, and W n is precisely this interparticle distance at zero temperature. Okay, and I set my temperature proportional to n to the power one third, keeping this parameter B fixed. Okay, so then this function, this F, this scaling function, so is just this again the Fredholm determinant. This should be capital D Fredholm determinant of. Uh, this edge kernel, edge kernel is precisely that, and this P S is just a projector over the interval. So P S, you remember, is just a projector over the interval s to infinity. So this is just the whole probability. That is, what's the probability that uh, there is no particle between s to infinity? So it's just indicator function to say that the argument, this guy here says that z is between s to infinity, and this guy here says that z prime. Is between s to infinity. This is exactly what Harvard said also. Okay. So, so this is the finite temperature generalization of the tracy Widom distribution. And once again, if you take the zero temperature limit, you go back to the Airy kernel and you go back to the tracy Widom distribution. So, okay. So this 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 is the sort of uh, finite temperature generalization of that. Okay. So now. This is the connection to the KPZ equation. Again, this will be a repetition of what uh, what Herbert already said, but just wanted to make the link uh, between the two problems. Okay, so you remember from uh, Herbert's lecture that uh, there is this is the Stokowski's experiment, and you have this liquid crystal, and you have this uh, height variables, uh, which is just the uh, the so is you know the 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 metastable state which is uh, at the back, and there's a stable state which is propagating in that. And uh, so the H satisfies this KPZ equation. You have seen that all before. And uh, so the width of the fluctuations of the height. Okay, if I go in a particular direction and look at the H, which is a random variable, and if I look at the you know variance square root of the variance, that will grow as t to the power one third in an infinite system. And uh, and the distribution of the scaled height. Okay. Uh, so this is the second moment, but if you look at the full distribution and properly centered and scaled, then in the long time limit, because it's a droplet geometry, it goes into the tracy Widom GUE distribution that uh, Harvard has already said, and uh, and then as he mentioned that the the full height distribution uh, of this KPZ equation, uh, this was this sort of exact solution which is obtained by Sasamoto's phone and uh, also several other people. Mathematicians and uh, and uh, so they could actually compute the exactly the full height distribution, not just the second moment, but the full height distribution, and shown that it is the, the uh, tracy Widom distribution. And the precise statement of this uh, these things that Harvard already showed you again that uh, so imagine that this this KPZ height is growing, and I'm looking at a height at a particular point in space zero, and uh, and uh, then if i look at the height then you have this strange looking generating function which is uh, so i'll write down this here so ok 
Okay, so this is this angular average is over the distribution of the height. Okay, so that means if you write this object as h plus t over 12 minus s t to the one third times probability distribution of the height at time t dh. Okay, so this just means this. Okay, and so s is like a parameter, so you can think of this. You know, it's like a Laplace transform, but the, you know, it's a strange, some kind of analog of Laplace transform, not quite Laplace transform. It's a, it's a slightly different object. And what they showed is that this strange looking generating function is precisely a Fred Home determinant. So only variable here is uh, S, and this is the projector S to infinity, and this uh, with a kernel, which is, uh, which is given by. Uh, Precisely, this is the called the KPZ kernel, so ZZ prime. So the time here appears in this parameter t to the one third here. Okay, otherwise it is exactly this 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 form, and but this is actually this is an exact solution for all time t, not just at large time. Okay, and if you take the large time limit, then it becomes a tracy Widom distribution because large time limit, you see again the same thing happens. If you take the t going to infinity limit, it gets cut off zero to infinity, and you are back to the airy kernel. But this is an exact solution at any finite time t in this uh, droplet or wedge geometry. Okay, so <coughs> so once you look at that, so then you immediately see that uh, that the two problems. Okay, so so one is this free fermions at finite temperature, and our relevant parameter at this scale, dimensionless parameter, was n to the power one third over t temperature, and then we saw that the distribution of the rightmost particle position is given by a single scaling function f of s which is itself is a freedom determinant with the edge kernel which is given by this where the parameter b appears here okay and s is just the probability that you know this scaling variable uh, is less than or equal to s okay. and uh, whereas in the kpz equation on the left hand side you have a different object which is a generating function of the height but on the right hand side it's exactly same freedom determinant with the KPZ kernel, which which is exactly looks the same, once you identify the parameter b as uh, t to the one third. Okay, so so therefore in the fermion problem, this h bar omega n to the power one third over t, if you identify that with the time to the power one third in the KPZ problem, then the right hand side, the two kernels, I mean this this object's freedom determinant, they are exactly identical to each other. Okay, so this means that this random variable, which is in the fermion problem, this is also related to the random variable height in the KPZ problem. Okay? So how do we actually exactly relate these two? So let me just uh, do a little bit of algebra here. So okay, first let me define okay, a random variable, single random variable. Which I call G, and uh, so and the distribution, so the probability distribution that G is less than Z. Let's say this is e to the power minus e to the power minus Z. Okay, so this is a cumulative distribution of this random variable, and such a random variable is called the Gumbel distribution. So the PDF of this distribution, which is as the derivative of, with respect to Z of this probability distribution, <coughs> is just exponential minus Z e to the power minus. Okay, so if you plot, so this is a cumulative distribution. So if you plot this distribution, it will look like as a function of Z, it will go to Z goes to infinity, it goes to one. Because probability that g, this random variable is less than infinity is one, of course, okay, and it goes to zero as z goes to infinity, you know, very fast, super exponentially, and the PDF will look like uh, again, okay, I'm not drawing it properly. So here, for large z, it goes decays exponentially, 
whereas for large negative z it decays like uh, you know this uh, super exponentially so exponential of exponential so it is decays extremely fast on the left hand side on the right hand side it decays you know as exponential okay. so such a such a distribution is called gumbel distribution it's like gaussian distribution it's just a random variable okay so so i'm trying to give a meaning to this generating function here okay what does it mean as in terms of a random variable okay so now suppose that i want to compute this object so i take the kpg height and i take a gumbel variable which is independent of the kpg height okay so i take the kpg height and i draw a random number from this distribution and i just add them up okay and i divide by t to the power 1/3 so this is a random variable so i'm asking what is the probability that this guy is less than s so you know you, you just take your you simulate your kpg equation for example you get the height variable and you draw from your computer you draw a random number according to this distribution g and you just add them up so this will be a random variable and you ask what is the probability that this random variable is less than equal to some s what's the cumulative distribution of this random variable the addition of this height and this okay so what this means is that this is just what does this mean so this means this is the integral of the probability of the height right and they are independent times probability of g there are two random variables so it's a convolution of these two random variables and they are independent so i write them as product times the theta function of s t to the power 1/3 minus h plus t over 12 plus g dh dg right because just they are independent variables so the probability that this is less than equal to s is just a theta function that this has to be less than this is one when this is a heavy side theta function it's one when the argument is positive and zero when the argument is negative okay so we have this and uh, so now i can integrate over j g and so to have is probability of h so if i do the integral over g so essentially what you get is this is the probability that g is less than times dh but g is a gumbel variable right it has this this property so therefore this is just the probability of h times e to the power minus e to the power minus s to the power 1/3 minus h plus t over 12 times dh okay so i can take the minus sign inside and write this as okay but this is exactly this object here okay so you can think of the this object the meaning of this object you can think of it as as a sort of run is a cumulative distribution of kpz height plus an independent gumbel variable plus this t over 12 which as herbert explained it comes from the ground state energy of the lebel nigger type of model when we do the bethe answers okay so anyway so you have the kpz height you know shifted by t, t over 12 and you add to a gumbel variable and you ask what's the probability distribution that this is equal to this less, less than equal to s then this is exactly this object okay so now on the right hand side we have this freedom determinant of this i minus ps times k kpz times ps and so we have seen that this once i identify this parameter b as uh, t to the 1/3 b from the free fermion which is h bar omega n to the power 1/3 over temperature okay this yes, this guy so then this is also in the uh, fermion problem this is precisely the k edge of the fermion 
And this, by definition, is the probability that the x max t is, uh, well, rather, m minus r h, m being the maximum position over w n is less than or equal to s. Okay. So we started from this. So what it shows is that, therefore, all this implies that the probability distribution of the KPZ height plus t over 12 plus an independent Gumbel variable divided by t to the one third is less than or equal to s is exactly same as the probability that the in the fermion position the in the rightmost fermion position at finite temperature properly centered and scale is less than or equal to s okay so therefore by law you know this object the kpz height plus a gumbel variable it has exactly the same distribution as the uh, the x max t properly centered and scaled okay so this is uh, what we'll see in the next slide so so i take this so i have the fermion in a harmonic potential or you know generic potential and confining potential and then you look at the there will be r edge and there will be width so i subtract off this so this is my random variable centered random variable centered and scaled then in law this is exactly equivalent to the kpz height plus t over 12 plus a gumbel variable divided by t to the one third okay and this is true for all time t which means as long as you know this temperature if you keep this combination this scaling combination to be fixed then for each t you have uh, a distribution which is characterized by this uh, fred home determinant uh, with a kernel which is parameterized by this t okay so so this is a sort of nice connection to this uh, to the to what harvard has been talking about so you see these two two um, you know random matrix and how how it sort of you know the de determinantal process how sort of they uh, give rise to the similar uh, physics uh, so then, I mean, once you have that, you see, then, then you can uh, go back and forth. You can, you know, take results from the KPZ and uh, predict something for the, uh, for the edge properties of this fermionic system or vice versa. You can take, you know, the uh, edge properties, you analyze the edge properties and you can make some prediction for the KPZ height. So for instance, I mean, uh, these days, I mean, there have been a lot of work on the large deviation tails of the KPZ height. I'll not go into the details. But um, but you see the, the, the large. I mean, when you see this, you know. Uh, so one thing you notice that the high temperature he here means the short time in the KPZ problem, whereas infinite temper. Um, sorry, high temperature means short time, and whereas low temperature, when temperature goes to zero, that means it's the late time. Okay, so zero temperature is exactly like the infinite time KPZ. But finite temperature will means that you know it's a short time. Large temperature means short time in the KPZ problem. Okay, and so there have been you know analysis of that short time. You know, for example, if you ask uh, the uh, position distribution of this particle at high temperature, okay, relatively high temperature, much bigger than this, uh, when n to the power one third is uh, much, you know, small compared to T. Okay. So then you can actually show that you know this, this object, the distribution of the rightmost particle position, is again by analyzing the taking results from the KPZ, you can show that this is related. This Li five by two is again a polylog function, and from this you can calculate the short time tails of the height distribution in the KPZ problem, which is related to the the uh, large temperature fluctuations of the rightmost particle positions. Okay, so you can go back and forth between these two problems. Okay, so just to summarize, then, so what happens is that so as we, you know, physically, what is happening here is that I'm, you know, increasing the temperature. So you see, at zero temperature, for the rightmost, you know, I'm looking at this observable, okay, rightmost particle position. At zero temperature, this is the tracheoidum GV. This two means GV beta equal to two. Now, <laughs> as I increase the temperature, I'm near the edge. So we saw, we saw that the characteristic temperature scale is n to the power one third. That's this de Broglie wavelength. When, so when I'm below this temperature, so when temperature is below this, 
So then you have this, you know, basically it's a quantum world. So this is the quantum fluctuations. And quantum fluctuations are characterized by this Tracy Widom distribution. Okay. Now, on the other hand, if temperature is much bigger than n to the power 135, at a very, very high temperature, let's say. So then, as I said, that, you know, these, these, uh, these variables essentially become independent. And okay, so I didn't say that this Gumbel distribution also appears in the extreme value statistics of independent random variables. So let me just uh, mention that to you. So this is the slight detour. So extreme value statistics, this is a classical field in st you know, statistical literature. So imagine that you have a set of random variables, x1, x2, x3, xn. They are IID random variables. They're totally independent. And each drawn from some PDF, P of x. So each time I just draw a random number from this P of X. So I have a set of random numbers, n random numbers, and I'm interested in the maximum of them. So this is also going to be random variable. And I want to know what is the probability distribution of this maximum. So how do I calculate that? It's very easy to calculate. So if probability that x max is less than or equal to some number z, cumulative distribution, okay? So this means that the probability that all of them are less than or equal to z, right? If maximum is less than or equal to L, necessarily everybody should be less than or equal to z. And this is the crucial point. You see, if these variables were correlated, I couldn't do anything with that, okay? For example, in the RMT case, you know, remember the, in the RMT, that the joint distribution of these guys was exponential minus xi square They are correlated, so I cannot write them as, as uh, you know, product of ind independent random variables. So then, in that case, you know, so this is in general, this will be, you know, the, you take the joint distribution and you integrate from minus infinity to z of all these variables, right? So that's a general, general result va valued for any, va you know, valid for any uh, even correlated distribution. But the point is that, you know, when you have IID, you see, IID means what? IID means that this joint distribution you can write as a product of individual distribution. So they factorize. There is no correlation factor here. Okay. So in that case, you know, you see it becomes sort of trivial. So it just becomes Px prime prime integral minus infinity to z to the power n for iid. You cannot do that for generic, like you couldn't do it. So the fact that you get a non-trivial distribution like Tracy Widom distribution for uh, for GUE eigenvalues is because of this factor, because they are correlated. Okay, but if they were not correlated, if it was, you know, if you didn't have this factor, imagine that you didn't have this factor, then it will be just factorizable Gaussian distribution, and then, okay, so in general this is the distribution. And this is the exact distribution, and now we want to work out the tails of this distribution. Okay? So for large n, how does this distribution look like? Okay? So the trick is that you, you write this as 1 minus integral z to infinity, because it's normalized. So in the large n limit, you would expect that the peak will happen when z is also large. So roughly speaking, so then you can approximate it as e to the power minus n z to infinity. So in general, this distribution will depend on the details 
of this individual distribution p of x but if you are you know if you are going into the scaling limit that is you are going near the peak and just you know look at the scaling you know scaling regime there then all that matters for large z is just the tail of this distribution right the only contribution that comes from is from the tail of this distribution for instance if you take let's say positive variables exponential distribution that's the simplest case right so in that case you see that you can write this as exponential minus n e to the power minus z so okay, let me call it x and this one i can write down as exponential minus exponential minus z minus log n right so this tells me that the x max as a random variable approaches in the large n limit to uh, you know is a mean value which is not mean i mean this is this peak value which is log n plus an order one quantity this z and this z okay okay so this z is distributed as a gamble di distribution okay let's call it g so probability that g is less than or equal to z is just e to the power minus to the power minus z okay so in general what will happen is that you know you can work it out this is an exercise you can just you know, you know the exponential variable you take gaussian variables and you work out so what you'll find is that you can always write this as you know, some scaling function of z minus a n over b n so in the case of exponential distribution this a n is log n and b n is 1 in the case of gaussian you will find a n will be square root of log n and b n will be okay roughly 1 over square root of log n there might be some factors here and there but the scaling function f of z as long as your tail you know of your individual distribution is decaying faster than a power law the scaling function f of z is always going to be gumbel form so this is called the gumbel class so there are three classical extreme value distributions if the tail of px decays you know uh, faster than a power law then the scaling function is always given by the gumbel form if it decays as a power law then scaling function is known as a fresher distribution and if it is a bounded distribution pf for example uniform distribution then the corresponding uh, scaling function is called the weibull distribution okay so these are the classical three classical extreme value distributions so any any individual as long as their id and if you take their tails you know you can classify the three different fixed points depending on this tail and they are given by the gumbel fresche and weibull okay so the conclusion is that if i didn't have this term yes okay i didn't want to okay so no no good so let me do it so the statement is the following okay so you give me this p of x okay and you see from this exact formula here that what matters is the large x behavior of p of x okay because that's where the maximum occurs right so general statement is the following that so the probability that the x max as a random variable okay is less than equal to let's say uh, some number x so this in the large n limit it goes into a scaling form which is x minus a n and b n now this scaling so this this these guys a n and b n are non universal scale factors that depend on the precise tail of px so for example as i said for the exponential case so so example in the case of exponential if p of x is e to the power minus x theta of x then an 
is log n and b n is 1. If you take a Gaussian, then you can check, and this is homework, you can check that a n will be square root of log n and b n will be 1 over square root of log n. There might be some factor, one or two, I don't remember this now. So, but the point is that even though the scale, the, the scale factors are non-universal, it depends on the precise scale of, the, of your distribution, this scaling function, f of z, this is of this form, okay? So this is called the Gumbel distribution. Now, so the statement is that this scaling function can be only of three types. Okay? So the Gumbel Freche and Weibull. So you get a Gumbel distribution when Px as x goes to infinity, it has a tail which is faster than a power law. Okay? For example, exponential, Gaussian, etc. Huh? Bounded distribution. Yeah, yeah, bound. I mean, you take a uniform distribution. Take a uniform distribution. Okay. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So basically, you look at the tail. If the tail is too fast, so that it's almost bounded, you get a Weibull. If it is a slower power, you get a Freche. And if it is, you know, uh, unbounded distribution, but uh, decays faster than a power law, then you get a Gumbel distribution. Okay. All right. So anyway, for us, so what you see is that main thing is that you know if we didn't have this term here okay which is exactly what happens at high temperature that this somehow this this interaction term becomes becomes not important okay and then they behave like almost like um, independent gaussian variables so if you look at their distribution the maximum position then that will have the gumbel distribution okay so that's what i meant by this gumbel here okay so at very high temperature, you, the x max t distribution will be Gumbel. At very low temperature, it will be uh, uh, Tracy Widom. So Tracy Widom is like a quantum, and this is like a classical, if you like, uh, high temperature distribution. And if you are sitting exactly at that point, okay, that is, if I set my temperature to be exactly proportional to n to the power one third, and I introduce this parameter t here, then the distribution of x max t, you have a family of distribution parameterized by this t. This t is precisely the kpz time t, basically. Okay? And uh, so if I'm just sitting exactly at that point, then you have a whole family of distributions which are uh, parameterized by this parameter t. Okay? And, uh, so, and of course, in the uh, zero temperature limit, which is equivalently t going to infinity limit, you go back to Tracy Widom. Otherwise, you go to Gumbel. But if you are here, then you, you get a whole new family of distributions which are uh, characterized by KPZ. Okay, so that's the sort of main conclusion. Okay, so last few minutes, uh, 10 minutes, I'll just, I mean, so far I was talking about in one dimension, so, but you can, you know, you can see that, you know, you can easily generalize to higher dimensions uh, all these problems. I will not do in any detail, I'll just tell you the results. So again, I'm thinking of you know, free fermions in a confining potential in, in, uh, in, you know, dimension bigger than two, uh, dimension bigger than one, I mean, any general dimension, okay? And, uh, so I'll just quickly mention the results. I won't do any details here. You can, always look up in the literature that I mentioned. Okay. So, 
So in higher dimensions, basically, as I said, you know, the you know d dimension. So I mean, what happens? So so far we are talking about d equal to one and at finite temperature, and now I, you know, increase the dimension. So in both sides, uh, if you increase the temperature or if you go up to dimension d bigger than one, the connection to G V, which holds only at this point, d equal to one, t equal to zero, it's lost. But you still have this property of determinantal process, so you can actually you know make uh, explicit com computations okay so that's the point so for example single particle in a harmonic well in d dimension this is a thing this is, should be small h so this is a single particle hamiltonian so this is just you know a d dimensional laplacian plus this uh, r square and uh, so the global density first of all you can compute explicitly and this you can compute also from local density approximation or thomas fermi approximation so this will be, you know, this is in d equal to one, you have the semicircular law, but in higher dimensions you have a d by two here because it's like a cap. So let me see if I have some picture. Yeah. So for instance, this is just a two-dimensional thing. So you, d equal to two, that means it's mu minus r square. The mu is this just the Fermi energy. So you have this, you know, cap here. This is the analog of semicircular law in d equal to two. This is just a simulation of the. Uh, Problem for n equal to 28 particles, and you can see that it, uh, it sort of goes there essentially. Okay. Okay. So this is the average density, and same thing you can actually. Uh, so therefore, the density you can ask, just like in the semicircular case, you can ask if I am very close to the edge, what is the sort of finite n corrections to the density at the edge, and uh, so you could compute that. So the natural scale here is going to be n to the power minus one over six d. Okay, so d equal to one is n to the power minus one over six, and here the scale will be in just um, minus one over sixty, and you can calculate the scaling function for the density near the edge, and it just uh, is given by a more general formula like that. So if you put d equal to one, you go back to the this uh, airy function form, and uh, higher dimension is just this. Okay, so you can you can just analyze this is at zero temperature. Okay. And uh, so you get this tail. This tail is actually, you know, independent of d. Only d dependence comes in the prefactor here, and uh, here it goes like mod z to the power d by two. So this is the density. So you know, if we're going from the edge, and uh, and then you can ask for the kernel. So uh, so in d dimensions uh, at zero temperature. So the kernel will be precisely again, you know, same thing. So zero temperature. That means you have to just sum over all the single particle eigenfunctions. But going up to the Fermi energy, okay? and there's a trick to to manipulate these things. So, which is mentioned in this um, you know paper that I mentioned. I mean, it's not so easy to do the asymptotics directly if you try to do over this you know putting Hermit polynomials and uh, can compute this. But there's a there's a trick to connect this propagator the, the, to this kernel to the propagator of free fermions. And then do a short time expansion. So I, again, details I will not do. But the main result is that in the bulk, you find that the kernel is given by some Bessel function. Okay, again d equal to one. It this reduces to the sine kernel. Okay, and uh, and if you go to the edge, again you go to the r edge and you scale by this width here, you get a new edge kernel, which is uh, which which has this uh, this uh, formula, which is little bit complicated so i take two points close to the edge and they are you know and you have to define the normal component and this guy here is the integral of the array function and it looks complicated but it's not that complicated i mean in the end eventually everything is simple okay so um, so this is the edge kernel and edge correlations and then you can ask for the same thing the position of the so if you have a two dimensional gas now and uh, you can ask the distribution of this uh, Furthest fermion. Okay, so this is the analog of maximum in one dimension, and you can ask what's the distribution of the furthest fermion. And interestingly, what happens is that for d bigger than one, only in d equal to one you have a tracy Wiedem distribution. So, so I'm, I'm looking for now this guy, our max, which is the maximum of the radius of each fermion. Okay, and. Um, so you can compute that, and for d bigger than one, what happens is that this is once you pro center and scale it. It goes to Gumbel distribution. 
for any d bigger than one it goes to gamble distribution and the reason that happens i mean without going into the details is that you can again write down the freedom determinant the whole probability probability that there is nothing here outside with this kernel and uh, when you write in the you know decompose this into the polar and uh, radial component you find that the polar components you know they all decouple from each other so what that means is that in each direction angular direction if you look at the maximum position is like a tracy widum but they are independent from angle to angle so ultimately you are looking at the global maximum of a set of tracy widum distributed variables and uh, so you see that again by the same argument that i talked about the iid distribution so each angular direction is tracy widum okay but then when you are looking at the global of them which is a sort of you know maximum of a set of independent tracy widum distributions because they get they get independent in the angular direction okay so as a result you get gamble for any d bigger than 1 okay so this is uh, this is the sort of uh, interesting uh, result and so let me just uh, you know summarize and uh, conclude so so as an application so i you know talked about this free fermions in a harmonic trap in 1d at zero temperature and there you can see a one to one correspondence to the uh, gue eigen values of random matrix theory you can obtain exact results at finite temperature uh, and it becomes determinantal for large n or in the grand canonical ensemble for any n and you get a generalization of the sign and the airy kernel of the gue and the the edge behavior it has this interesting connection to the kpz in curve geometry so then you can extend to higher dimensions and finite temperature which i didn't have too much time to talk about but uh, you see all kinds of interesting things there and the universality of these kernels independence of the trapping potential and so on and of course uh, then one important question is that can one observe this uh, universal edge behavior uh in the cold atom experiments because you know this is the sort of things these cold atom people uh, they have been looking at this problem for a while but you know nobody sort of you know looks at the edge behavior so what we are trying to tell the experimental is that look i mean there's interesting edge behavior and uh, maybe one can measure the, the experiments and given you know the the rapidity with which these experiments are progressing for example i, I showed you this picture before this is this quantum gas microscope this is exactly this two dimensional free fermion gas in a harmonic trap so they have the pictures you know they can actually you know get a picture of this uh, fermion positions and uh, so so now it just you know you just have to measure them and uh, you know compare with the theoretical predictions basically okay so this is the sort of hope that uh, that this will happen sooner or later okay so let me just you know finish since this is my last lecture just to okay just to sort of say that okay so i mean uh, you know I, this was a sort of meant to be an introductory course to random matrix theory and i sort of gave you at least i hope i gave you some kind of glimpses of the you know uh, of the field i mean it's a very wide field there are a lot of applications and the main point about rmt is that even though you know it's almost 90 years old but you know you see that new applications are coming up uh, and with new applications uh, new questions arise okay so and so you know so when you have new questions you know some observables that people never thought about before they come from experiments they come from the you know new sort of uh, physics uh, which is evolving and so so rmt has still you know stayed a very active field for a very long time and again you know every day there's new applications which are coming up so in that sense this is a really a fascinating field with lots of applications and you know it's it's a simple system where you can do a uh, lot of analytical calculations which is very nice so uh, so i hope i just give you some kind of i mean even though you may not have followed everything but at least you have some idea hopefully uh, that now if you look at any paper in rmt will at least uh, or or applications you will understand at least uh, vaguely what is going on okay so thank you very much for your attention so